really a lovely manual. And so um, you'll notice that in that 
particular group, um, you'll notice um, what I think of as kind of like three different stages of healing. Sometimes um, the statue is just kind of ripped out of the ground and nothing is, is replacing it. Sometimes, um, you know, um, local municipalities will put, put a lot of uh, energy and effort to kind of make it disappear and erase it. Sometimes those attempts are awkward. Um, you know, like where they plant some bushes like in the shape of what is clearly the pedestal of the statue. Um, and then sometimes uh, local artists or municipalities will commission, um, you know, new works of art to go in that space. And um, I always think that's pretty telling because it tells me a lot about how much money they're willing to, you know, sort of put at the problem, but also a little bit about how much trauma, you know, that, um, that particular space may hold for them, right? And so, um, so you'll find all of the different, um, you know, sort of approaches. Um, and then as I was kind of, you know, investigating those spaces and looking at those spaces, I started to, of course, wonder where these statues had gone to. And so I just started looking for them, again, online. Uh, I teach, so I'll spend most of my school year, um, you know, researching and kind of building a list of, of targets that I might want to shoot when I'm in Europe. And so um, I remember, I think it was, yeah, so this, uh, this photo right here is one of the first photos I took in the group. Um, and this part of the project, which I call Idols, um, and they had dumped that head. And, and I don't know if you can tell, but there's also a statue of Stalin kind of right here. And there's a few other things sort of scattered about. They had dumped them in the back of a, um, of a history building. It was the, it was the Museum of History. Um, and so we, we uh, you know, took the buy a friend with me. We, we, I just wanted an excuse to go see Tolerant, right? It's in the Serbian. So we, we went there and um, we went to, uh, went to the History Museum and you're kind of walking up to the entrance and I kind of just kind of scooted around to the back and skipped the front door. Um, and, you know, just found this stuff laying in the back of the, of the building because I had heard that it was there. Um, and so it's a bit of a gamble and it's an expensive gamble to, uh, you know, to plan a trip to Tallinn because there might be a statue in the back of the building. Um, but I like it. You know, I, I enjoy the travel, I enjoy exploring, you know, um, I'm, in, I'm, you know I'm enjoying uh, exploring Portland this weekend, right? I, I, I come here to look for things and to experience it, to see it, and to be here. And that is part of the process for me. What I really, what I really like is sort of the, the, the act of going to those places, um, you know, getting there, right? And so, um, so that photo kind of, again, set me off on a journey, and I started exploring um, more places where statues have been, have been dumped. Um, some of them are more sort of curated, right? So there's a lot of spaces, like in Hungary, um, you know, they have Memento Park, which is a well-known example. Um, so you'll see a few examples. This photo right here, for example, is from, from Hungary. Um, and, um, you know, this is two things, right? There's a statue of Lenin here, a bust of Lenin. And then there are these kind of reliefs that are on the ground. And I had a curator tell me one time that it feels like this is like a body count, right, that goes with, <laughs> that goes with um, Lennon. But the interesting thing about those reliefs is that they were the reliefs that were around the Stalin statue in downtown Budapest, right? And so, so they, yeah, they went around with the, the pedestal, essentially, standing up. Yeah, right, yeah. And so in that, that photograph right back there, with the, with the, the giant sort of pyramid-shaped monument is where that very statue stood in downtown um, Budapest, right? Um, and Hungary is one country where they have put a lot of energy and sort of had to deal with this, um, you know, with this issue. And I think that's a lot because they had a very bloody revolution in 1956, um, you know, where they, um, you know, they fought back. Right? And, and, and really almost succeeded, and had they gotten international help, they would have succeeded in sort of breaking through the Iron Curtain. So, um, so they were very traumatized by that, and they put a lot of energy into sort of how to deal with those spaces. Um, I think there's a few other, yeah, so this photograph, for example, I discovered while I was waiting for the bus to get back into the, into the city, I went to check, I left, I'm shooting, you know, hours, and then I left to catch the, the bus. It's kind of, you're out in the suburbs of Budapest. And um, the bus was like 45 minutes, you know, it was gonna be a while. So I decided to kind of wander around outside of the park. And um, in this, they had this kind of cement pedestal type thing. 
And I walked around behind it, and underneath it, they had these things sort of, you know, sort of easily accessible, but you would never know if you didn't walk behind the thing, right? And so, um, so there's a few other photos, I think, from that. There's a photo back there from the Mental Park as well. Um, and then um, there's a few photos here from Lithuania. I ended up going back to Lithuania in 2019 because there's this, there's this park called Brutus Park, where they, um, it was actually a private collector ended up buying a lot of those statues and kind of making a park. And they call it, they call it Stalin World because it's like Disney World. They have, they have little um, rides and they have animals um, in cages, which is just ridiculous and horrible. Um, and so you can go and you can kind of see a bear in a cage and the statue of Stalin. You know, um, yeah. And, and so, um, you know, so this photo is from there. I think that Stalin that's in the forest back there is from Lithuania and Rutas Park. Um, and so just kind of started digging around, right? Trying to find these things. Um, the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Stalin in the, in the labyrinth, a lot of people ask about that photo. That's in a private collection that um, is in the Czech Republic and it's inside of the labyrinth and you can buy tickets to, to go through the, the labyrinth, right? It's just, a, it's just a maze with bushes, right? It's one of these classic European kind of deals. And, um, you know, my wife had heard about it. She was on a kind of retreat with her girlfriends and she came back and she said, I heard there's like, there's a Stalin in some maze, you know, somewhere in this part of the country. I said, we're going, we gotta go. So we, brought, we brought the kids, right? We brought the kids with us and we, um, we buy a ticket to go into the maze. And the lady that sold us the ticket, she said to my kids in Czech, she said, there's a monster in the center. <laughs> And so, sure enough, as soon as we got to the center, um, they had this, this Stalin sort of poking up out of the ground. Um, and so there's a lot of weird, you know, you, you, you'll, you'll always kind of uncover some weird stories like that, um, looking for these things. Um, you know, the, the one that's uh, right behind the uh, sea there is, is one that I discovered. I kind of had to break into uh, the storage of an art museum in, um, in Slovakia for that one, but, but, but my driver actually um, was talking with some construction workers and kind of getting them distracted um, while I took the picture. So it actually worked out really beautifully because they, 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 they were there and it kind of seemed like I was allowed to be there. Um, but I really had crawled through a hole in the fence to get into that. So, um, so yeah, there's lots, there's lots to talk about here. I feel like you know, I'm hoping that this is going to be a conversation. I'm hoping you all have questions for me. Um, but I've seen this work take on, um, you know, kind of several different lives, right? And so I started doing these photographs in 2014. And then in 2019, it took on a whole different life because of, you know, what was happening with monuments in this country um, and everywhere, really. And so and now it's, it's taking on yet another life because of what's happening in Ukraine. Um, and it's, um, it's just been interesting to watch these images sort of have their own life, right? And, and um, you know, and have them kind of be interacting with what's happening in our, in our world, um, which I think is very pertinent and relevant today. And um, I think how we talk about, you know, the post-Soviet world is important. And I think that the way, um, you know, I try to photograph the post-Soviet world in an objective way, I don't, like sensationalizing um, the fall of the Soviet Union or communism in general. I, I, I don't like these sort of photographs that focus on ruins that are sort of oversaturated color photographs. You know, I'm trying to have a conversation, I'm not trying to tell anybody what to think. Um, but I think that the, uh, you know, I think that the work asks important questions, right? And so that's why I did it. So I'm glad you brought up going on here because I started thinking about that immediately and we have a number of empty pedestals and we had a really interesting incident where an artist smuggled in a replacement hmm. of uh, Albert Conte the Department. So I'm wondering are you photographing in this country and, yeah. uh, now too? Yeah. So it's expanded. <laughs> Yeah, it's, sure. It's a good question. I, I, I talk about that a lot. Um, I get asked about that a lot, I guess. I mean, you know, for me, my initial reaction to what was happening here was that those wounds were too fresh. And so, you know, what I, what I love about this work, about making, about the act of making this work, is that it's, it's not easy. 
You know, it's, it's kind of, I like the challenge of finding things that are hard to find and sort of going to places that feel um, obscure um, or unimportant, right, when in fact they are important. Um, and so for me, when all of that was happening, the last thing I wanted to do was run out and photograph those spaces, right? I am, though, photographing those spaces um, from time to time. I am looking at them, and I am thinking about them, and I am making work about them. I don't know what will come of it, right? And so I've been looking at, for example, American monuments in a, in a particular way um, for a while. Um, and it's, it's funny, I was kind of working on this today. I, was, I, have, I have all these like, Google Docs on different projects that I have going on, because I always have like, five projects. Um, and I'm thinking about American monuments and sort of, you know, the way we, you know, sensationalize violence and, um, you know, how we memorialize things, right? And the fact that you can see a part of the World Trade Center in pretty much every major city, you know, and things like that, right? And so I'm, I'm looking at that, I'm thinking about that, I'm photographing that, but I also want time to take, you know, I want time to kind of have a function in the work and allow some of these things to stop. Right, so when you rip a statue out, they ripped out a statue in my hometown recently, a few weeks ago actually, and I keep telling myself, I should be photographing this, right? It's like right around the corner. But I've been just looking at it, you know? I just really enjoy looking at it. I like watching the grass grow and sort of seeing it go through its various iterations of, of you know, first it's a patch of dirt and then growing grass and it's fenced off and then now it's grass and pretty soon it's gonna be like you'll never know it was there. And I like that process. Uh, yeah. There was an incident in Centralia over 100 years ago, um, a uh, conflict between the IWW and the, basically the establishment of the army, the, the veterans, and there's a big war monument to them in the center part, and as far as I know, it's still there, memorializing the veterans, but um, somebody, um, I don't know how they got it, but there's this muralist that uh, on the left who came and painted a huge mural above it. Mm -hmm. That would be an amazing photo for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, there's so many. Yeah. 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 I just, on NPR just the other day, I heard about a giant rock in Lawrence, Kansas that was you know, removed from um, a Native American uh, area, brought to Lawrence, and then they put a plaque on it celebrating the settlers of the area. Ooh. And now they're getting the rock back. <laughs> ah. You know, and the, and, the, and, the, and the local tribe is gonna put it in back where it belongs. And the thing that I keep thinking about is what are those little holes gonna look like from removing that plaque, <laughs> right? right? That's the stuff I love, right? I love walking around the streets in Europe and seeing that something's missing, you know? And wondering what was there, and trying to figure it out. And so, yeah, I really am interested in that stuff. I'm also interested in the Cold War and how we kind of look at that in America. And so, I live in the D.C. area, and I've been photographing um, uh, signal sites and drop, drop, dead drops, which is where um, people would leave packages and, and, and signals for, in, um, you know, in, in, in espionage. And they're just random places, you know, it's a telephone pole on a random street in a suburban part of D.C., and I'll go photograph that telephone pole, you know, and people are like, what are you doing? Like, you know, there's no question, you know, but the neighbor that lives next to that telephone pole, they don't ask, they know what I'm doing. They know exactly what that telephone pole was, because they probably remember all of that, right? And so, um, yeah, I just find that really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. How does doing this project change the way you look at this sort of piece and post-truth line of what's going on. Obviously, you know, the, we've had plenty of that with, in our own Trump way, but, yeah. um, but how, how does this kind of in, inform your reading of the paper these days? Gosh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think yeah, what do they have to do with truth? I don't, I don't really know the answer to that question. Um, you know, when I read the paper, I'm really interested in the little blurbs, you know, more so than the front page. Um, and I find really interesting things in there. Um, and so, um, but you know, lately it's, it's, um, it's Ukraine 
And you know, it's what I heard just the other day that they the Russians put up a statue of Lenin. You know, that had been taken down, right? And so, you know, the, the monument wars and, and that kind of thing. And um, you know, for me, it's about topography in a sense, right? And the layers of history. Um, and, and looking at you know, sort of remnants of what we can still see of a, of a space, um, even after it's been repurposed. Um, so there is some truth in there somewhere, you know, um, because it, it is there, right? Um, you know, I'm thinking about, for example, that statue of um, Stalin that was re removed in Berlin. And they took down the Stalins, by the way, in the 50s. So there are a lot, there are, you know, when, when Khrushchev came, came to power, Stalin was suddenly, you know, not cool anymore. Right? So they did this, this process of de-Stalinization right, in the late 50s. Though, though recently in the Czech Republic, I found a place where they left Stalin up until 90. Yeah, I love going to that place. But, but that particular spot looks like that's where Stalin stood because there's a fence around it. But actually what happened was they put a fountain where Stalin was, and then the fountain broke. No! Oh, so they put a fence around it. Right? They didn't know what to do so, um, so there's like layers. Right, of information that's happening, um, which I really just enjoy exploring. Yeah, yeah, this is the problem of that. How these are these, these move so nicely together, yes. Yes. and I like how you establish these icons that that have been separated from their previous selves, and it's and it's in our head as we see the rest of them. And then you have those empty spaces where now you know there there is something that we can put there. Yeah, and visually it just carries us from one to the other. I just like how you create a way of sort of visually moving through all of this, and it has a connection separate from the from the um, from the times. I mean, a couple of years ago with the uh, the Confederate statues, the discussion would be of a different sort here. With sure. The same photographs. Sure. But but I just like how you use the space. Create an image that we carry with us as we see them. Yeah, thank just you. move it through that. Well, it props to see for installation, right? Yeah. Um, you know, my, my only sort of like um, thought was just that I didn't want them separated into two groups. And so, um, you know, Steve did a great job um, with choosing how they would go and finding relationships between certain images. Um, but I, I like them as one body of work. Um, and so, um, you know, it depends on how you view them, right? There's 40 images in this project. Um, and um, ultimately, you know, they'll be in a book, right? And I think that they, they will be separated in that case. Um, but in, in this um, sort of setting, I, I like the idea of being able to kind of move between them, you know, more fluidly. Yeah. I, I just had an observation. I had the opportunity to take my, my two sons from the 18 and 20 at the time to uh, to Vienna uh, for a, a relative's uh, wedding. And, and one of the days that we were there, we were like, oh, should we go to Prague or should we go to Bratislava? Mm -hmm. And we went to Bratislava. Uh, later on, uh, somebody who I knew in, in, in Prague and said, oh, why did you go, why did you take them to Bratislava? You could have gone to Prague, it's much nicer here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't really say anything, but you know, I'm, I'm thinking when we, when we arrived in Bratislava, we totally got lost. We got off the bus. I was like, well, I think the castle's over here, they, and you know, the one that's on the river. And uh, we ended up walking through this area of Bratislava that had all the um, apartment, the Soviet-style apartment complexes, and, yeah, the you know, and a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, uh, war-type statues, uh, heroic figures and fountains that were no longer working in kind of barren area. And I was, afterwards I was really glad that, that I brought them, that we ended up getting lost because it's something that they had never seen that part of the world. You know, we could have gone to a tourist area, but instead we you know, stumbled through this area until we finally found where we wanted to go. Yeah. And um, it, was a, it was a great, Learning experience. We had we had lunch at a place where the where the waiter uh, was educating on the difference between the the, the, the money situation in 
Czech Republic versus Slovakia. Yeah. And you know, they've got this great one-day education outside of the beautiful places in Vienna that we visited. Sure. And, uh, um, if they were here, they would, they would really appreciate uh, what we've done. It's, uh, because they would be totally related to that. Well, in spite of what you're saying, you made a statement that we are not, we don't have this political sort of way or message with the, with the answers. It's interesting to me because they're, for me, they're absolutely politically covered. I mean, you can't get away from that. You know, and so I'm thinking, well, have you shown this one? In any of the countries where the you know, ex Soviet bloc, and I would think that, boy, you get a very different reaction to this from the people yeah. that are occupied, yeah. you know, by the Soviets. You know, right. sort of like, and I'll tell you, it, it's politically charged, and you're going to know about that. Yeah. yeah. That's going to be your primary reaction. Sure. Right? Yeah. So yeah. I'm sort of wondering, like, how, how do you deal with that? If you were gay cop, and it's like, I would think the logic of the big question would be politically attacked by some yeah. sort of significant political. Well, you know, actually, the, the Europeans have, have seemed to love this work. Um, and so I've been um, featured in several um, you know, news sites and blogs and, and things like that. And there's this, uh, there's this site in Lithuania called Team Baltic. I love Lithuania, by the way. I'm kind of a Lithuania fanatic. And, <laughs> and so um, Deep Baltic is like kind of this like special sort of um, website for me. And they, they did a story on the project. And, um, you know, I, I really just, that for me was, um, you know, the, the best thing because I, I wanted that kind of feedback and, and that kind of conversation to happen. And so the, the work, um, I feel like, is interpreted in different ways in different places, right? Um, and so here, where you've had a lot of statues sort of, you know, removed, Recently, it has one sort of conversation, and then there, it's a different conversation. Um, but they get it, they like it, um, and so um, I've recently been working with a couple of European writers um, on essays um, mm -hmm. for the for the project. Um, and uh, Chris has put together a, um, a Mad Cow book for the for the project that'll that'll be here next week. And there's a essay by um, by a German writer um, that that I feel like is just perfect for for the work. Um, you know, he talks a little bit about, you know, sort of the, the power that these monuments had and the fact that, you know, the need to kind of cart them off to the suburbs and put them somewhere um, really just shows how powerful they were, right? You know, the, the need to kind of dump them or sell them or, you know, melt them down. Um, you know, not, not in, this, in this exhibition are some of the images that I shot recently in Dallas where um, I, I discovered that a, um, a rich collector had been buying the statues and importing them to Dallas for his private sculpture garden. So I was able to go out there um, and take some photos in his, in his sculpture garden. And so, you know, the need for um, for these communities to kind of want to get rid of these things so badly just shows how, how um, powerful they were. But also, the thing that to me is like, okay, who are these people that want to collect or want to preserve? Right. Right. You know, I mean, you're on the other side of the institute. Yep. Well, there are people that think we won the Cold War and they want a trophy. Um, and so, you know, that's why they do that, right? And, and there's a politician, for example, in, in London that bought one and has it in his sculpture garden as well. And so there are people in the West, and, and some of these towns wanted to monetize these statues, and so they auctioned them off. And so that, that for me, is a part of the story. So a part of the post socialist landscape is some guy's backyard in Dallas. You know, and so that's um, you know that for me is an important part of the story. Yeah. Can you walk us through maybe one or two of the needs uh, in terms of your approach to composition? Like the one I'm writing back to is pretty pretty interesting. The juxtaposition between the two statues and the you know the light and maybe even some kind of circular sort of composition or or land like right Why did you position the land that way as opposed to taking photos? Did it just appeal to you as telling the story the best, or do you have a special to, to thing? Me, about to me, composition is totally intuitive. And, and so, you know, as, a, as an educator, one of the things I do with my photo students is I, I, I tell them to get rid of all those rules that they've been taught. 
You know, they go, they take the team design, they're taught a bunch of rules, and they come into your critique, and they mention, the first one that mentions the rule of the thirds to me is like, you know, that's my, that's my opportunity to pounce, right? And so I, I try to get them to forget all of that stuff and approach the thing intuitively. And, and, and that is what I do. Now, you know, in this, in this photo, I mean, what you don't see is that I'm crouched down and leaning against a wall because my shutter speed was like 15 of a second, yeah. and I needed that, right? And, and so, um, you know, there's always that kind of stuff that's going on, right? Um, but I don't, you know, a lot of times you don't have the opportunity to bring in a 12-foot ladder and shoot from any angle you want. I mean, like, for example, inside the center of a ladder, there's two places I can shoot that photo from. One's in front and one's behind, right? And I shot both, right? And so, in every other second, somebody would walk in and say, everybody, you know, people are buying tickets. And they'll pop in and they'll be, oh, I found it. And then I've got to wait, you know? And then the sun is like doing its thing, it's making a shadow, and that really pissed me off. And so I have to wait, and I have to wait for a cloud to cover the shadow, and then for no little kid to come into the middle of my photograph. And so, I mean, I think I got like three shots, you know, of that, of that um, sculpture that I thought I was going to be happy with. Um, and, and, then, and, and, and my wife's like, we got to go, the kid needs to go. <laughs> so, you know, that's how, that's, how, that's how it works. Or you'll go to some spot. Like, I remember this, the, the one that's right behind this pole here, which I, which I actually loved. And I'll just walk over there if you don't mind. Um, you know, this is, in, this is in a very remote part of, of Latvia. So I went to Riga, and it's, it was kind of like an expensive trip, but I wanted to see I wanted to see Riga, but I only had like one photograph. I was like, I gotta get another photograph on this trip. So I went to this, I took the train out to this random place, and I could see on Google Earth that there was a big pad of cement where this statue had been. And it was this giant lemon statue that was overlooking the, the sea. And I was like, oh, this is gonna be amazing. The, they haven't done anything, you know, they've just ripped it out of the ground and they left all the stuff, right? And so I was like, I gotta get that photograph. I showed up, and there's like, you know, construction crew. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I'm cleaning and doing stuff, and I was like, oh my god, what are we getting? And I've gotta get on a train and get back to the city, because I'm gonna be stuck in this like remote part of Latvia. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you're kind of forced into certain photographs, right? Um, because there's like a truck park here, mm -hmm. you know? Or he's like right behind me, right? I can't remember what it was. Um, but I needed that photo, and I needed that, like I didn't want that. Sometimes I don't mind there to be a little something. There are people in these photographs, I remember the writer, you know, I had to correct him, because the, the guy, the German writer, he wrote an essay about my work, and he said, there's no people in the photographs. I said, that's not true. There are people in the photographs, right? There's a guy walking, right? <laughs> and there's a few people right there, you know? And so, so he had to revise the essay and he called them the points of list elements. <laughs> the essay was really like um, so sometimes sometimes I don't mind that that's happening. I mean I know this space really, really well. This space is a very important space. This is this is where the statue of Stalin was in downtown Prague. They blew it up with dynamite. And a lot of people think that the head rolled straight into the bolt of a river. Um, but the, the thing that's cool about this space is that this is where skaters hang out, and this is where people go. I mean, I used to go there, you know, in the early 2000s and drink and smoke, right? Like, because that's the cool place to go. Um, and I never really got it, you know? Um, and the thing that's interesting, though, about that space is in Czech, they call it Ustalin, which is by Stalin, right? So if you say, I want to meet you at that spot, you wouldn't say, I'm going to, let's meet at the metronome. You would say, I'll meet you, Ustalin. So, that's the interesting thing to me about that space. And now, I actually just visited that this past summer. There's a cocktail bar underneath, <laughs> and it's called Stalin Cocktail Bar. So Stalin was removed in the 50s, but he's still there. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you, I feel like I've been leaving him out of the conversation for a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you typically work in black and white, or is there a particular reason for this topic? Great question. I, I don't, uh, I do both. You know, I definitely have some color projects. Um, and I don't know why I started this project in black and white, but it was, again, sort of an intuitive thing for me. Um, and I, 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 I'm 
I'm not sure if really, I don't think I've ever taken any color photographs for this project. You know, the interesting thing about this project is before this project, before I did the residency in Lithuania, I did a project called East West where I was photographing um, checkpoints from the Cold War, from the Iron Curtain. So they were, they were spaces that had been sort of abandoned because of um, the Schengen Agreement. And I did that in 4 by 5 black and white. And I felt like this project was a little bit of an extension of that. And so that is probably why I started. Uh, partly I asked because in your uh, beginning remarks, you made a reference to uh, oversaturated color photographs of, yeah. art, of ruins. Yeah. And, and I have seen dramatic color photos of the huge, almost science fiction like structures built yep. as memorials of the Second World War in the Soviet Union. And so, is there some kind of contrast to that that you're working on? Well, I don't like those pictures. <laughs> um, for me, these, these, this is a, a little bit more of a, a way of being objective. Um, you know, it's an inductive process. Um, and, and so I'm reducing it down to, a, to another level. But um, yeah, again, I think it's, it's sort of like the composition thing. I think it's a little bit of an intuitive thing for me um, in terms of, of those types of aesthetic decisions. If this exhibit were a historical essay, what would be its thesis? <laughs> wow. That's a great question. If it was a historical essay. <laughs> well, I think the thesis would be something about the way, you know, we control memory um, with interventions in the landscape. You know, that, that was essentially my thesis in making the work. Right, that was my first sort of inclination in looking at the at the at the spaces. You know, I was interested in the decisions that people were making and what it said about how they felt about that space. Um, so that decision, you know, to remove a thing is, is one thing, but then how do you replace it? That's a heavy decision. Um, and uh, we are going through that now, right? And so I, I and, and again, I started this in 2014. I didn't realize that was going to be the conversation, but. I was interested in, you know, what that decision process was like and how it resulted with the landscape that we interact with. So, it's a great I was question. curious about that one. Is that yeah, one? that's the other photo I got a lot of, right? So this is this is where the Lenin statue was in downtown Riga, and they and there was this sort of um, artwork there. Um, that um, is actually a video art um, sculpture, and so that so there would be that design that you see on there is moving, oh. and so there was this it was this kind of glowing moving thing, uh -huh. um, and I remember hearing something weird about it. It's kind of like this you know arch thing, and I remember hearing that. I think if there's like a group of people that still meet there that are oh. sort of like you know. Communist or something, I don't know, I can't remember. They were saying that it still has, it's a charged space for sure. But yeah, that video or um, sculpture was there. Yeah, it's strange. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would love to. that, you know, it's important to understand that, that um, monuments are property. 
you know, and so I think that that's something that the Europeans understand better than us, right, as a collective. And, um, you know, I think that that, that you know, whether or not you, you make monuments to people, I, I don't know what to say, but, but it's important to understand what they are and their purpose, right? And they're always done um, as a form of propaganda, you know, depending on the time period they put up and the input. And, and so I think that that is just important to, to understand. There wasn't a huge debate after 89 about taking these down. There was some debate, but they all came down really fast. Um, so they, they certainly understood the power of these monuments and they ripped them down pretty quick. Why do you think we have it? <sighs> we probably haven't had the type of regime change that they've experienced over there. Um, yeah, I know. One, 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 yeah, so far. Um, and so the, the, I remember this one writer um, that I really loved wrote that, um, you know, that the average lifespan of, of a um, communist sculpture is about the average lifespan of a, of a Soviet man, right? And, and so uh, 50, 60 years and it comes down and somebody replaces it with something else. Um, and so it's just important to, to understand that, I think. Well, in, in terms of the, the question about your about composition, in fact, it seems to me almost without exception, there are a few, that everything is dead center, centrally, you know, the thing you're, it's like very, you know, it's, it's very clear what you're taking things about, what you're taking things about, it's right at the center. And if, it's, and if the object is missing, it's not the center. There's something that replaces it. And of that, you know, that lift there, a tree there, mm -hmm. the bushes there, that replace the actual painting. So you're really basically making it clear and choosing to sit basically make a statement that's central, I think, and, and with no other like design factor, we're sort of trying to make a tricky composition. We're just recording this. It's very yeah. straightforward. Yeah. Because you're just centralizing through subjects. Sure. You know, so there is that that obviously that choice to me is obvious mm -hmm. that this is what you're showing. It's, there's no mistake. This whatever's in the center, pretty much in the center of your composition of your photograph, is what you're supposed to be paying attention to. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, yeah I, I just say, you know, my follow up on Hop, what's Hop was saying. Um, the whole leveling thing with where kind of the horizon is, mm -hmm. and then everything is shoved back. And um, the longer that I'm looking, the more mysterious that it is. Because from a distance, you know, you're just saying, so why is the wolf like that? <laughs> yeah. and, and then my second thought would be there are a lot of places in the world that this could be without knowing maybe that it's complaining or it's here or it's there. Yeah. There's a certain kind of blankness to um, a lot of architecture now in the world, like particularly maybe the third one. Some of those buildings are, are anonymous in Europe and are anonymous here. Yeah, I think it depends on your, um, yeah, it, it depends on, I think, and I, I don't know this, but I, I think it has to do with sort of how familiar you are with, with, with you know, Eastern Europe and mm -hmm. certain spaces. I, that's, you know, I think when I show the work to people that, that, under, that sort of live here or, you know, are very familiar with these spaces, they kind of get that right away. I see it there. I have this weird insider-outsider relationship with Eastern Europe, and so, um, you know, for me, it feels like that. I, I see that. I also think there's, you know, some dark humor in the work, and I do like to, you know, I do sort of infuse a little dark humor <coughs> in the work. I mean, how ridiculous it is, you know, to, you know, he looks kind of sad, right? And like, that stuff, but I mean, yeah, there's certain stuff that comes out, you know. I'm not sure it's purposeful, though. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you, you, you talk about the, um, the idea of statue of being a propaganda uh, uh, mich um, tool and the method. And uh, one thing about propaganda is about scale, it's about that, um, that uh, quality in your face. Um, and, uh, and also, when we talk about statue, we we'll, we'll often talk about the monumentality of statue, oftentimes they would become like very big, and, uh, but it's very interesting to see that kind of quality 
it's been absent in your work. So, which I'm really curious about, like, um, um, how, like, it definitely goes back to your choice of like composition and uh, you know the, the way you 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 you, sh you, you shot the photos. So I'm just wondering, uh, first, have you ever encountered any like statues in this country that's like ridiculously uh, massive, or if you ever encountered a statue that is that big, would you, would you, would you, would you, would you take a photo in a way that will preserve that kind of monumentality of the work, or would you step back and uh, take the, oh. take the photo of the statue in a way that it will appear just like all the other statues, kind of like the, the, the eyesight, or even like lower, uh, uh, even lower than your eyesight, so mm -hmm. yeah. I don't, you know, I don't know the answer to the question. I mean, I'm not sure that I can, um, you know, say how I would photograph a statue um, that, you know, sort of I would hypothetically encounter. Um, there are, I mean, I, I do see a lot of huge statues, and they, you're right. I mean, they do that on purpose. Um, that that the, the scale is important. You know, there's no, and also where it's at, how you encounter it up on a pedestal and, and whatnot, and so. Um, you know, hard to say. It's easier to say with the empty spaces, you know, when I really was kind of focused on having the exact location represented and also how people might encounter that, that space um, or would have encountered that, you know, um, statue. And so, but, yeah, I don't know how, how to, um, I, I don't know how I would photograph it, you know, um, going forward. Most of these were, you know, they fit. They fit in the frame. You know, I don't remember counting anything that was, you know, too large to really kind of get a good um, perspective on. It. Yeah. I just keep thinking about the statue of Lenin in Ukraine on Seattle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah which I need to go see that. Yeah, I need to go see that. Were there lots Yeah. Yeah. They do that. They do that a lot. Yeah. The hand. In Lithuania, they splash green paint. You know, because that's their sort of national color. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I was, I was interested that you said you chose way to learn people. Um. So it sounded like you made a decision that you did to want people, mm -hmm. not even though. You know, when you're yeah. Not very noticeable. Yeah. They, I mean, I think that you know. Again, it's it's actually another aesthetic question because I think that they ruined the photo. <laughs> you know. Or, yeah. You know, I think they're gonna sort of like I don't like them there. And it, again, it's an, another kind of intuitive aesthetic decision of like I don't want that there. Yeah. The same reason I don't want that white pickup truck there. Right. You know. And so, um, yeah, again, that's, that goes back to aesthetics, I think, too. There was no purposeful, I'm a patient shooter, there's no doubt, but there wasn't necessarily a purposeful, I'm gonna make a project about people, you know, I do that. That never occurred to me. I started making photos, and then that was, became a thing, but I never even tried to keep with it or anything like that. But I can, you know, if you imagine, you know, somebody walking through this frame, that would upset me. Yeah. I just didn't know that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, when well, they so did walk through the frame, I just wouldn't, you know. They're, they're back now, you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and they're always there. I mean, people are always there. You yeah. Know. But it would be a distraction to what you're talking It'd be about. a distraction. It, it would so be, be a distraction. It's a distraction. I mean, yeah. you eliminate that, it makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. I mean, and that's why, and also, by centralizing your subject, you know, you're also avoiding yeah. any kind of confusion about what it is you're photographing. Yeah. So you're eliminating distraction in that sense in terms of like putting in the center. Yeah. Like that, that Again, you know, for me, for me, it, the research, the, the looking, the going to the place, that's all a huge part of the making of the photograph. Mm -hmm. You know, when I get there, I'm not necessarily trying to make some interesting composition. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an act of finding a thing and going to the thing and documenting a thing 
right? And I have a particular aesthetic, there's no doubt about it. Um, but again, that's part of me not wanting to sensationalize the subject. If you get down low and what kind of view and all that stuff, I don't, I'm not interested in any of that. It's a minimalist approach, really. It's, it's a modernist approach, I think, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't believe there's a piece. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a frivolous approach? <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking there's no people in that, and I didn't know why until a certain point I sort of finally figured it out. Which is, there is a person in the picture, the picture is you, the viewer, standing in front of them. So you're having a direct interaction yeah. with the subject rather than it being a decisive moment. Here were a bunch of people doing something at this instant. It moves it into a different kind of time frame. Sure. It's more like you're looking at it in a slow, contemplative time frame where it's a long exposure that people disappear. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much.